We're going to be entering sort of a mini-series on the tongue. And last week, we looked at the power of the tongue, looking at and being reminded that our mouth, our tongue, is given to us by God that has the potential for great power to destroy or to build up. We saw that our speech reveals our hearts, that our speech has been given for specific purposes, namely for His glory. And as we consider some of those things, we're reminded, hopefully over the last several weeks, you, you join me in, in endeavoring to memorize Proverbs 21, 23, the one who guards his mouth and guards his, uh, guards his tongue and guards his mouth, guards his soul from troubles, that, that we considered as we walked through our week, how, how am I using this God-given powerful instrument? How am I using my tongue? How am I interacting with other people? How am I using this thing that God has given me for his particular purposes? Am I using it his way? As I mentioned last week, and and, and has hopefully sat a little bit in your mind, we use our mouths constantly. We constantly find ways of communicating. And we even touch very briefly on the fact that not all of our communication happens verbally. How, how, we, how we communicate as we text, as we communicate, as we uh, interact with other people in ways that do we even pause to consider, is this glorifying to God? Is this the most fruitful way that I should be talking? Is this the best way that I can represent this thing? Should I even be engaging in this conversation? Or better yet, what am I listening to? How am I even using the faculty of my ears? Maybe I'm not participating, but I'm just listening to what they were saying. In all of that, it's a question and a matter of how's my heart doing in this? Am I using my body, and in particular, my organs of communication, my mouth, my tongue, my ears, am I using them in a God-glorifying way? Now, I want us to consider this evening some ways in which our mouth can be misused. What are some misuses of the mouth? And I have several for us to cover. I don't know how far we're going to get this evening. We didn't get as far as I wanted to last week and what we looked at. We'll see how far we get this evening. But the ones that I'd like us to look at this evening, we're going to focus on the book of Proverbs. So you can go ahead and turn. We're going to be beginning in Proverbs chapter 1. And we're going to be flipping around a little bit this evening throughout the book of Proverbs. And so I'd invite you, if you've got your Bible, please try to follow along. I'll do my best to, to give us time as I mention different passages of Scripture so that we can put our eyes on them so that as we consider this topic of the tongue, as we consider communication, we're hearing from God's Word, using our eyes to read God's Word. We're, not, we're hearing it with our ears as it's being read so that we're participating most fully in this. But before we dive really into the specific misuses of the tongue that I want to that I want to talk about this evening, the specific mis- misuses of the mouth, I-, I want us to consider why we're looking at the book of Proverbs in the first place. Why are we going here? Because I- I'll-, I'll be honest with you, I thought about okay, I'm just going to search through the scriptures. I'm going to do a topical study. I'm going to look through God's word just on the subject of the mouth. And it was, it was astonishing just how many mentions of the mouth there are, even apart from the mouth of God, or the tongue, or the lips, or, or different things. And I began to consider, man, if we were to take the time and consider, and we'll look just very, very briefly at just a small, select portion of Scripture that's going to deal with this, if we we're just going to look at the topic of lying, and just do a scriptural survey of that topic. I don't know, but I haven't begun that study yet, but I don't know that we could get through a single book of scripture where that didn't come up in some form or fashion. Maybe the word lying isn't found in the book, but deceit, falsehood, false witness, or at best, misrepresentation. If that wouldn't come up in every single book, So why Proverbs? 
Why stick to one? Well, part of that is just for simplicity's sake. Let's limit ourselves to one book as we consider this topic. And we'll go to a couple other places. But all the way in the beginning of the book of Proverbs, in chapter 1, where I've, I've asked you to turn, we're given the purpose statement for this book. Beginning in verse 1, Proverbs 1 is going to say, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in a wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel, to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. And then probably in your Bible, this is offset just a little bit, almost as if it's separating from the, the, the previous paragraph, but I think it's a very natural connection. And I'll show you another place where it's going to do the exact same thing in just a second. But you'll see verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. In other words, because of the way that Proverbs and Psalms and poetry in, in the Bible and in particular in the Old Testament works, things are placed parallel to one another very often. They're placed in parallel as these things are the exact same message said two different ways. So as in verse 7, it's going to say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So if I want to grow in fear of the Lord, I can't despise wisdom and instruction. If I want to fear the Lord, I need to receive and be receptive towards, positively receptive towards, the idea is used elsewhere in scripture of being hospitable towards wisdom. If I want to fear the Lord, I need to be ready to receive wisdom. And verses 1 through 6 tell me that's exactly what this book has been written for, to give wisdom and instruction. If I want to have a mouth that's fearing the Lord, if I want to have fear of the Lord being exercised in my life, I need to receive what this book is going to tell me. I need to be receptive and willing to hear and willing to listen to exactly what this is going to tell me. And in chapter 2, we're going to see something very similar. Flip over there, chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. There's several of these sort of my son introductions in the book of Proverbs. At chapter 3 is going to begin almost identically where it's going to say, my son, if you will receive my words, chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1 is going to be, my son, do not forget my teaching. And again, it's this sort of long runway approach towards understand what you're about to get. Understand as we go into the book of Proverbs, here is why it's all here. Here's what you're learning. I've mentioned before that when I teach, and, and, and if, you, if you've ever, every now and then I give my notes uh, when I get up to teach like on Sunday night to, to Eric um, and, and, and get his critique afterwards of was that clear, was that understandable. Um, and he knows right in my notes towards the end, and if you've ever heard me teach and you've picked up on it, I have a number of verbal tics, but one of them is towards the end I'll say, so what? So what? So what about us? Because, and this is exactly what the writer of Proverbs is doing, he's saying, he's front-loading every instruction that he's going to give with the so what. Here's what. Here's why. Look with me, chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom. Incline your ear to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Man, speaking of the organs of, uh, of, of communication, from the mouth of the Lord comes knowledge and understanding. I mean, if we want to get knowledge and understanding, if we want to have instruction and wisdom, if we want to receive instruction and therefore have the fear of the Lord, 1-7, then we need to be attentive to the mouth of the Lord. And in particular, a book that's geared specifically towards, here is wisdom from the Lord. 
we would do well to take heed to it. So as, so as I consider, okay, we're going to be considering misuses of the mouth. We're going to consider the way that we use our tongue and, and ask, is this a God-glorifying way that I'm communicating? Where can I learn to do that? Proverbs. Where can I get wisdom and instruction about how I'm living my life? The, the guide, the guardrails for discerning between that which is pleasing to the Lord and serving wisdom or that which is displeasing to the Lord and leading to folly or a lack of wisdom. And I'm going to go to the book of Proverbs. So Proverbs is for guidance. We need Proverbs like we need a map in an unfamiliar area. We need Proverbs like we need directions from a local in an unfamiliar city. Like a pilgrim in a strange country who's unfamiliar with the local customs. Because, beloved, that's, that's what we are. We're strangers. We're not at home here in this world. And as believers, that's doubly true because we're, we're not at home in this world, but we're not at home yet. And as we walk through this world, we're being taught, here's the, the customs of the country to which you are going. Learn those. And you need to unlearn all of the customs from the country in which you are now in. And Proverbs functions that way. It gives guidance. Because this new life, if we're believers, this new life that we're commanded to walk in is not natural. We need all the wisdom we can get. It's a new life that we're commanded to walk in and empowered to walk in. It's unusual. It goes against the grain. So we need instruction because our instincts are wrong. Our fleshly impulses are wrong and flawed and they're going to teach us to go in the wrong way. Enter the book of Proverbs. So one of the big things that Proverbs is going to do is going to give us a look at how we're not supposed to act. Don't do this. It's foolish. It doesn't demonstrate fear of the Lord. It doesn't align with godliness. Instead, here's the way that we take. Here's the path. Though it's unfamiliar, it's actually pleasing to or towards the Lord. So Proverbs is going to equip us to take that path. And it's unappealing to our flesh, but it arms us for godliness. So we're going to begin looking at a few uses of the tongue, staying primarily in the book of Proverbs. Now that I've, I've primed us, and, and that's, that's my plug for this one of 66 that we should dive in, that we should take good heed to, that we should just live in well. Let's consider a few misuses of the tongue. And the one that we're going to begin with, as I mentioned last week, I, I think it's interesting these won't surprise us. We know that they're bad. We know that they're sin. If we were to take a walk through those doors down the hall and enter the first door on the right where you have the kids that are from about four to six age range, four and five-year-olds, and ask them, hey, should you tell the truth or should you tell a lie? I don't know that there's a single kid in there who's going to say, well, yeah, lie every time. I'm not asking what their practice is. I'm not asking how they behave in your homes, my home. I have two, I have one in there. Yeah, the other one moved down the hall. I have one in there. But they know, and we know. We know lying, the first misuse of the mouth that we're going to talk about, we know that lying's bad, but it's one of those common realities that I think is so common that we lose sight of just how bad it is. That it's so common that it's kind of acceptable. Everybody lies every now and then. You can't get through the day without lying somehow or some way or to the point where we just lose sight of the destructiveness of it. Which again, enter Proverbs, where we're going to have realigned for us the realities of everything in life. Beloved, please, please, don't fall into the trap of somehow believing 
that the Lord is arbitrary or random in his commands. That the Lord is just somehow, yeah, I don't want you to do that thing and that thing and that thing and all of these. Don't buy into the lie that actually says sin isn't that big of a deal. Mark it down, read about it, look around and view it everywhere in our world. Sin brings death and destruction each and every time. And if we buy into the lie that somehow our sin isn't that destructive, we won't take it seriously. We may not see it blossom, we may only plant the seed, but sin always brings forth death in its maturity. And it's one of the oldest lies that sin isn't that sinful or sin isn't that dangerous. All the way back in the garden, we see that. Think back to Genesis 3. Think back to Adam, Eve in the garden. Serpent comes up. And one of the first things that he does in his attack of, did God actually say that? Did, did God give that command? Are you sure you understood it right? And then he outright says, God lied to you. You won't surely die. In fact, then he lies about the sinfulness of sin, the destructive nature of sin. You're not going to die. In fact, it'll be better if you disobey. Have we ever considered that in the nature of sin? How deceptive our sin is towards us about itself. It's not that big of a deal. If you sin, it won't end up badly. If you disobey God's clear command that we're aware of, it's not going to go that bad. You can handle the consequences. You can, it'll be better your way. So one of the things we're going to consider in just a second as we talk about lying, as we talk about deceit, that somehow we believe this desperate lie that our dishonesty, our deceit will somehow be better than truth. It'll be better than what God has said. It'll be better than what is. Than what is. That we know better than God in this situation. And we go all the way back to the garden and begin acting like our first parents, trying to unseat God. We know how to rule ourselves better than him. So all the way in its opening chapters, Proverbs is going to tell us how the Lord views lying. Look with me, Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, we're going to begin in verse 16. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. There are six things, verse 16 begins, there are six things which the Lord hates. Now, I don't know about you. If I'm reading that, that's got my attention. The Lord hates? Now, first of all, that, that ought to arrest our attention about our concept of God. And we talk about this a lot, and rightfully so. If you were here about four weeks ago, then you would remember that one of our first non-negotiables is a high view of God. We have to view God accurately. We have to recognize, yes, God is love, but that equally demands, as his word states, that he hates. And we need to consider, as we're about to go into this section, am I doing things that the Lord hates? And understand all that that's going to entail. Understand that that, that means that the Lord is against, actively opposed to, in all of his unchangeableness, and all of his omnipotence, that means having all power, in all of his justice, meaning that he doesn't waver in how he views things, in all of his wrath, that he executes that standard of justice, in all of his sovereignty, that he has no limit in the ability to pour out that power, Am I engaging in things that that God hates? There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Now, real quick, just so that we understand what we're getting into. We already 
pause a second on hate, but let's, let's take a second on abomination. This is something that's detestable or disgusting or unclean in the eyes of God. He hates them and he views them as disgusting and unclean. Verse 17, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among the brothers. Understand, beloved, what God just said in his word. And how interconnected all of these are with lying. Before we look at that, let's, let's consider why the Lord would consider these an abomination, why he would hate them. We already talked about this is the instrument, one of the instruments that brought death into the whole world. It was a lie that helped birth sin into humanity. God didn't really mean that. That won't really happen. That means that when we lie, when we deceive, we're dealing in the same currency as the devil. We're speaking his language, we're using his goods. All these are connected to lying, a haughty, haughty eyes, it's a wrong view of self. It literally means a high look. Viewing ourselves incorrectly. That's a form of self-deceit. If we think that everything's about us, if we think and we engage and entertain pride, that's a form of self-deceit. The universe is not about us. The scripture is very clear that all things were created by him and through him and for him. And if we somehow twist and buy into the lie that everything should be about us and our comfort and our enjoyment, then we entertain the lie that somehow we occupy the central role in the universe. Next, a lying tongue. As I already mentioned, if we were to go down the hall and ask the four and five-year-olds, is it okay to lie? They would all tell you, no, ninth commandment, we know, Exodus twenty sixteen. you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. But even just a few chapters later, the Lord is going to state this again. Hold your place here in chapter 6. Look with me at Proverbs 22. Excuse me, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal faithfully are his delight. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. I, I read that. I looked at that. I was, I was studying through this. And as I thought about it, I, I, I immediately thought back to one of the things that we mentioned last week. Isaiah 6. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in a people of unclean lips. Not to, not to break the, the seriousness of what we're talking about. Have you ever been into anything really greasy? And it's just, it's, it's, it's like it's everywhere in your mouth. One of the first times I really remember that experience well, we were at a corn maze in college and they were selling um, deep fried Twinkies. <laughs> That's the right face for that. <laughs> deep fried Twinkies. Now, if you haven't had the opportunity to take those five years off your life, <laughs> Twinkies have that porous spongy cake so when you drop it into a fryer and bring it back out and you bite into that, it's just grease everywhere. And you just, you're wiping your mouth and, yeah. I read this verse, lying lips are an abomination of the Lord. And unconsciously I just, are our lips an abomination of the Lord? I want that coal from the altar. I, I need purification. Beloved, please don't lose sight of that. As we look at these things, 
as we look and read it, all of this this evening, please don't lose sight of the fact that there is purification, that there is deliverance. Please don't be, again, deceived into thinking that somehow our sin is more powerful than our Savior. Please hear that, believe that, know that, see that in Scripture. That our sin is not more powerful than our Savior. And he strengthens us to walk in the way, to walk in righteousness. Yes, our sins are many, but like we sing, his mercy is more. Back in Proverbs 6, verse 18. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil. Verse 19, a false witness who utters lies. We'll see this more fully in a little while. But it almost seems redundant there, doesn't it? A false witness who utters lies. Well, of course, it's it's a false witness. What they're doing is lying. But understand all that that entails, especially in the context of the book of Proverbs written in the Old Testament, written under the Mosaic law. For somebody who's a false witness, there's a lot riding on that. Somebody who bears false witness, even in our own day, we have laws against bearing false witness in a legal setting. Why? Well, because if somebody is punished, convicted on false testimony, that's a terrible weight that brings with it. In Deuteronomy 19, where some of this mosaic code is laid out, it talks about for a false witness that's discovered the thing that he was intending to to bring about on his neighbor's head. If a false witness is discovered, he'll receive the punishment that he was hoping his neighbor would get through his lie. Verse 19 ends, and one who spreads strife among the brothers. Somebody who's there just to divide. We have a middle school here at CCA. Drama, drama, drama. The things that'll just get spewed out and said and spoken with an idea of, I don't really care what's going to happen. I just sort of want to watch. I want to see what will happen. Can I pit that one against that one? Can I say that they said this about them? I think this is, I believe this is what the writer Proverbs has in mind a few chapters later, Proverbs 25, 18. You can look at this if you want, Proverbs 25, 18. I referenced it last week. Like a club and a sword and a sharp arrow is a man who bears false witness against his neighbor. It's bearing instruments of death when we deal in lies. I thought about bringing all those in. I thought about, I've got, a, I've got a club and I've got an arrow. I've got a sword that I could have brought in. And I thought about just holding all those up and saying, this is what it's like. This is what God's word says is like when we bear false witness. It's just throwing those into the crowd. As we cast lies into the lives of others, we're launching arrows and implements of warfare into their hearts and lives. Quickly, just a few other texts on the effects of lying. Because here's the thing, now we see how the Lord views lying. It's an abomination, it's disgusting to him. He hates it. And while our Lord is slow to anger, he will not hold the guilty blameless. He absolutely will bring guilt to bear. I want us to consider a few, a few of the effects of lying that are discussed in Proverbs. Look with me. We'll, we'll look at a few of these. Proverbs chapter 20. I told you we'd be jumping around a little bit. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 17. Bread obtained by falsehood is sweet to a man. But afterwards, his mouth will be filled with gravel. (coughs) Lying won't bring about satisfaction. Gain brought about by deceit will destroy the one who consumes it. I I don't know if you've ever tried this. I haven't. 
but I'd imagine that taking a mouthful of gravel is not going to be very helpful to my dental work. Now, in the moment, by the appearances, by what verse 17 just said, bread obtained by falsehood is sweet to a man. Oh, this is good. I got away with it. But it will not bring satisfaction. It will only bring about destruction. Look across the page, Proverbs 21, verse 6. Same principle at work. The acquisition of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor. The pursuit of death. But nobody knows. I can get ahead. It's okay. I won't be caught. It's a fleeting vapor and you're pursuing death. Proverbs 17, verse 20. Just a few pages back, Proverbs 17, verse 20. He who has a crooked mind finds no good. He who is perverted in his language falls into evil. The idea of being perverted in your language there isn't just the topic of your conversation. It carries with it the idea of its crooked speech. It's crooked speech. It's, it's not straight talk. It's misleading. It's misdirecting. It's diverting from the truth. And it brings about calamity. It brings about falling into evil. Or how about this? A few pages back from here. Proverbs 14, verse 25. A truthful witness, Proverbs 14, 25, a truthful witness saves lives. But he who utters lies is treacherous. Again, we can understand by extension the parallel that's at work here. The one who utters lies isn't saving lives. The one who is a truthful witness, the one who speaks the truth is saving lives, but the one who utters lies is doing the opposite. He's destroying them. But we need to get this straight. Our, live, our lies never bring about good. No matter what we think about the good intentions of our lies. Well, I don't want to hurt them. God's perfect wisdom says you are if you lie. But it would bring so much hurt and devastation if they found out and you are guaranteed that it will if we lie. Again, this is us pitting our wisdom against God. When, when we decide, well, I, I'm going to embrace a lie rather than the truth, we're either accepting or rejecting God's perfect wisdom, God who knows, sees, and is in control of all things, or us and our limited capabilities. Let's just consider the practical outcomes of some of that. How many of you have ever taken the gamble with the e-light on your car? The gas gauge. I'm I'm bad at this. I'm 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 very bad about this. We can make it. And I carry a spare gas can for a reason. But understand, we can't even judge these things rightly. The weather forecast. This hurricane was this recent, most recent hurricane was was one of those other sort of instances like that. We have some folks who, this was their first hurricane this, this season. My, my wife made the remark after this last hurricane passed, Dorian, um, all the hurricanes that she's been in Florida for since, since we've been married, um, all the hurricanes that she's been in Florida for have been, quote, a disappointment because they're supposed to be these great, big, terrible storms and then, nope. And she said, I'm okay with this. I'm all right. But what is that indicative of? What do we all talk about? What's the sort of joke about, well, I wish I could be, you know, a weatherman and get paid for being half only right, uh, being right only half the time and, you know, different things like that. And just, we don't know, but it looks like and maybe and we'll see. We can't determine what the weather will do, much less what tomorrow will bring. And we want to take the gamble of, I think it'll be okay. I know that God's word says this, but I think maybe I've got this one. I've 
got a really good reason. Paul addresses this exact thing in Romans chapter 3 when he, when he talks about this and says, well, can, can my lie be used as progress for the gospel? What if I lie for the sake of Every now and then, these sort of things are, are, are put, to, put to practice in, in our own exchanges with things, sort of the bait and switch. Every now and then, uh, we, uh, a number of years ago, I, I used to use the little, the little tracks that were in the shape of money, and it looked like you know, a $20 bill folded in half, and then you pull it out, and it's got a gospel presentation on the other side. I always just was a little uncomfortable using those. Because I felt like that might be a little deceptive. I don't know how receptive somebody's going to be to thinking, ah, I had 20 bucks. Oh, what is this? Oh, well, now I want to learn more. I just didn't see that happening a whole lot. So I was a little uncomfortable using those. Why? Well, because I felt like I might be beginning with a lie. It's, it's being deceitful, but for a good cause. I, I don't know that the Lord sees it that way because of what Paul says in Romans 3. What if I lie for a good reason? That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. Over Proverbs 26, 28 tells us that a liar hates his victims. But I'm lying to them for their own good. No, you're not. That's one of the really terrifying things about lying. We'll see this more in a minute. Deceivers are often self-deceived. And their motives. And their desires. But scripture is clear about the fact that lying is destructive. And if we disagree with that, if for a moment we entertain an open the back door just an inch to the lie that, well, maybe, what? Maybe God's word is lying about this? Maybe God got it wrong? Maybe your circumstance, my circumstance is unique in all of the universe for God's eternal purified word? God's got it wrong? Beloved, are we so easily led astray? Proverbs 19.28 is going to say a rascally witness makes a mockery of justice. Here's yet another effect of lying. Makes a mockery of justice. It, it perverts what God intended for protection. It twists and manipulates. Again, in the context here, of the Old Testament laws being brought to bear that had been delivered by God for the good of the people. And we see that that principle, that theme carries over into even the New Testament outside of the scope of Mosaic law, that it's the Lord who ordains governments. It's the Lord who provides them. Romans 13 tells us that <clears throat> the Lord is the one who puts the sword in the hand of government to execute justice for the righteous and to protect against those who would do evil. And lying makes a mockery of that. Lying twists that and says, well, let, let, me, let me see if I can use the system. Let me play the game with the system and get what I want to have accomplished for my own purposes, for my own ends. But beyond the effect of lying, we ought to realize what lying is doing to the image of God what lying is doing to the image of God. And when I say image, I don't just mean the reputation. I mean you and I. Lying is contrary to God's character. All the way back in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God says, let's make man in our own image, in our own likeness. And when we lie, we're distorting the image of God to the rest of creation. I, I truly believe this, that one of, the, one of the premier reasons why we 
tend to distrust, disregard, be suspicious of God's reliability is because of how much we see in his image bearer lies, dishonesty, deception, unreliability. Because in the creatures that God has made to create and care, excuse me, to carry and to project his image across his creation because we are so readily unreliable and untrustworthy. When God says, you can believe me, all we know is, I've heard that and it hasn't worked out. We have 66 books that proclaim the reliability, the trustworthiness, the honesty of God. And I truly believe that one of the reasons that we're resistant to, well, is because as image bearers, we don't represent this reality well. I think that's one of the reasons within the basic structures of commands, the Ten Commandments, we find the command, don't bear false witness. Because it's destructive, yes, but because it's not reflecting the image of, the, of, of God that we bear. Because as God is setting out, here are just basics of representing, this is what I'm like. The Ten Commandments open up with, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I, I'm the Lord your God. Don't do these things. And, and right there in the midst of those is don't bear false witness. And again, we, we've talked about this a lot. We have commands from scripture because we need them. We have to be told not to lie. As a basic part of representing who God is, as a basic aspect of conforming to the image of God that has been defaced, that has been damaged, that has been twisted and marred through the, the, the sin that we're all born with, it doesn't come natural to tell the truth. Instead, we're natural born liars and deceivers, misleaders. And so when God lays out, here's what I'm like, here is my standard, and it's just a basic level, don't bear false witness. He's informing us something about himself. I don't lie, therefore you shouldn't either. Think of the commands that are given in Leviticus, are repeated in, in Peter and in, in his epistles. Be holy because your God is holy. By extension, we can say that within the command structures. We see this attribute in God, we should reflect it. Titus 1, 2, God cannot lie. Lying lips are an abomination in his sight. How about in ours? Do we view lies that way? Do we view dishonesty that way? It's disgusting, it's unclean, I don't have anything to do with it. I, I won't tolerate it, I hate it. Or is it, Everybody lies. We consider this in some of my classes here. I've mentioned it before. We talk about God has no reason to lie. When we consider the reasons, the most common reasons why people lie, well, so somebody doesn't know the truth about them. They want to make themselves look better or not look as bad. Well, God has no reason to exaggerate. He's already supreme. He's already the highest. And he's got no skeletons in his closet that he needs to hide. He has no reason to lie. What about when we lie unintentionally? I said I would be here by this time, but I didn't plan well. I, I, I wasn't able to be there at that time. I lied accidentally. Well, God foresees all possible circumstances. There's nothing that can thwart his plan his power. There's no way in which God is going to overpromise. How about because we can't control events and we're scared of the outcome? Uh, I didn't mean to do that and this happened as a result so I'm going to try to cover it up this way because if I don't well God is in control of all things. 
There's nothing that's outside of the scope of his power and he never makes mistakes. He has no reason to lie. Lying's outside of the character of God. And scripture makes plain that when we lie, we're like the devil. Think about Jesus' interaction in John chapter 8 with the Pharisees. Flipped over there with me. Just very quickly. John chapter 8. And this section really begins in, in verse 31. And we, we have to read these verses. We're talking about truth and we're talking about honesty. Verse 31, so Jesus was saying, of John chapter 8, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And if you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And when he talks about truth there, he's not just talking about as opposed to falsehood. He's talking about the ultimate reality of who he is. If you know the truth, you confess the truth that God has come in the flesh and the person of Christ and that in that coming, he has come to take away the sins of the world by his death on the cross and in his resurrection. He has come to deliver the power to walk in obedience to him. If you'll know that truth, that truth will make you free. Well, they answer him. We're Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. And the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I've seen from my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you've heard from your father. Beloved, we mentioned this last week. Our mouth reveals the condition of our heart. The way that we speak, the things that we say, they reveal our heritage. Verse 39, they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you're Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you're seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You're doing the deeds of your father, they said to him. We're not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And Jesus says to them, listen to this. If God were your father, you would love me. But I proceed forth and have come from God, for I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It's because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Beloved, what, do, what does our speech reveal about our spiritual paternity? Does it reveal that you know, we stand and we walk in the truth? Or does it say and reveal and speak You have your father, the devil. Do we desire truth? Because here's the thing. The scripture says that that's what God desires in the inward parts. You desire truth in the inward parts. You desire truth in us. But are our desires in line with God's? Do we desire truth? And I don't just mean as opposed to falsehood. I mean truth as it's revealed in God's word. We'll walk quickly through this last bit. I already mentioned lying is what liars do. We read one of these Proverbs earlier, but the idea of, as you read some of them, it's, well, that's it's what it means, obviously. It's redundant. Back in Proverbs chapter 12, it's going to say, he who speaks truth tells what is right, but a false witness, deceit. Proverbs chapter 14 Verse 5 is going to say, a faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness breathes out lies. The 
In other words, it's just doing what comes naturally. A false witness breathes in, breathes out deceit. In other words, you can trust the dishonest man to be dishonest. And a few verses later there, and still in Proverbs 14, verse 25, a truthful witness saves lives, but one who breathes out lies is deceitful. Well, of course. I understand what that's saying, beloved, is that deceivers deceive. It's what we ought to expect. But very often deceivers are deceived. They're buying into the lie that lying is better. But here's some more wisdom from Proverbs. Chapter 19, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 5. A false witness will not go unpunished. And he who tells lies will not escape. Beloved, that ought to chill us just a little bit. That ought to encourage us just a lot. The one who tells lies will not escape. That ought to burden us. We can get caught thoroughly in our own hurt to where we don't feel compassion. Do we have any pity on those who as it stands will not escape? Same chapter, chapter 19, verse nine. A false witness will not go unpunished. He who tells lies will perish. Chapter 21, verse 28. A false witness will perish, but the man who listens to the truth will speak forever. <clears throat> Beloved, what does our speech say? How are we using our mouth? Are we buying into the lie that lying is better? Are we speaking the truth? from the inward parts out of the desire to please our God with our mouth and not misuse it. Let's pray. Holy Father, we are a people who so often come before you with unclean lips, who so frequently Use the gifts that you've given us to disobey you. Father, forgive us. Cleanse us. Purify us that our lips would speak forth, bring forth, sing forth your praises. That we would uphold the truth to be pleasing to you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.